And today we are going to be going on a virtual tour. Magic School Bus is going into the Winograd Ski Column today. So I have brought in two Winograd Ski Columns. Um, one is Simon, Claire, Megan, Courtney's, Mariah's, and Katie's. So it means you forgot to take it home. But here it is, and it's pretty darn beautiful. Um, you can see that it's beginning to develop a lot of different color striations in it. And we're going to talk about some of those bands. Now, I also have another Winograd Ski that's been growing for a longer time and one of the neat things about this one is that you can really see deep down into the bottom where there are pockets of black and it's in those depths that we want to begin our uh, overview of the growth in the column and of course in those depths there is no oxygen so the organisms that are living in those areas the bacterial populations are living either by fermentation you guessed it or alternatively by anaerobic respiration so we have populations that are doing both. Let's start by talking about the genus Clostridium. Yes, down there is Clostridium. And so we have things like Clostridium tetani, Clostridium botulinum, and many of those notorious pathogens. Clos not all Clostridial species by any means are pathogenic. Um, they are in the larger phylum Formicutus, which some of you have read about even within the context of the gastrointestinal um, microbiota populations. These are found in Bergie's Manual, Volume 3, um, and they're rad because they can ferment a lot of really interesting things. So remember how when we were building our Winogradsky columns, we began by mixing in newspaper, and that newspaper looked really good to Clostridium. They can ferment cellulose, so this is one of the things that they eat and chow down on. They can also ferment other things, such as sugars, amino acids, and hey, check that, fermentation of amino acids. Now our poster group called the Criminal Minds, which plug for their poster, you should def go visit it. Uh, the Criminal Minds have been looking at the use of microbiota in forensics, but they may be interested to write in one of the things that you mentioned was uh, in dead bodies. And so this is really going to be interesting to you is that the process of fermenting amino acids is actually uh, called the Strickland reaction and it's actually putrefaction. So if you've had the dubious honor, dubious honor, I don't know, the dubious experience of having uh, smelled a dead body that will often smell like putrefaction. So those who might be headed into uh, forensics or you want to be a coroner, this may be something in your future. Again, these are gram-positive endospore-forming rods. We talked about that the other day, that just like Bacillus, Clostridium also forms endospores. And of course, it does include Clostridium tetani and botulinum that we've talked about in, at length in lab. However, it also includes Clostridium perfringens. And this is where I thought Colin would have some interesting experiences. The injuries that commonly lead to gas gangrene are when there's shrapnel that gets in, lodged in an anaerobic reach of the body. And if not properly treated, then Clostridium perfringens will grow up in that anaerobic reach and it causes gas gangrene. So this is the causative agent of that. So these are commonly found, as we mentioned, in anaerobic microenvironments like that shrapnel wound, but they're also found in the gut. So of course, we can talk about Clostridium difficile, which is the famous uh, nosocomial cause of, of diarrhea or and or antibiotic-associated diarrhea. And of course, some of you have been looking at probiotic type approaches to that and fecal bacterial therapy or fecal transplantation uh, works really well in treating that disease much, much better than antibiotics do. Okay, deep down in this column, not only do we have the fermentative clostridia, but we also have the anaerobically respiring desulfovibrio. So let's look at the broader group to which desulfovibrio belongs. It is a sulfate-reducing bacterium, and we know when that occurs, the product of reducing sulfur is, you guessed it, hydrogen sulfide gas. So these generate hydrogen sulfide gas, and that, as you might come to realize, what do you look for in a sim tube when you see the generation of H2S? You look for the reaction with the iron in the media forming iron sulfide pockets of black. So in this particular column, we have some pretty beautiful pockets of black where you're seeing desulfovibrio uh, go into town and really growing uh, using anaerobic respiration, generating hydrogen sulfide. 
So in their processes, their metabolic processes, they're giving off this H2S gas, which as we're going to learn in a moment is extremely beneficial if you happen to be um, an anoxygenic phototroph living above in the column, it is your source of electrons. Let's say more though about desulfovibrio, found in anaerobic mud, as we might guess in the Winogradsky column, marine sediments, sediments of polluted lakes, streams, sewage lagoons, digesters, all of these anaerobic locations, right? Um, and then there are, is more than just desulfovibrio. I talk about it because it is a common character in our Winogradsky column, but there's 12 gram-negative genera that are a part of this group. So it's pretty broad and diverse. I have a couple of pictures showing some of these. Um, so you can see upper, upper left, you can see is kind of a, uh, a vibrio-shaped cell, and that's desulfovibrio. So that's where that name comes from. Um, you can kind of see down below that we may have something that's shaped a like more like a cocobacillus desulfobacter. Now here's where we get to say that it's not just in oil refineries where pipe corrosion is an issue. So remember the, the epic character Archaea globus, the Archean, was responsible for pipe corrosion in oil refineries. But of course we talked about how our pipes can corrode as well. And that's, that's disulfovibrio and other uh, sulfate reducing bacteria that cause that to happen. They're not uh, thermophilic the way that Archaea globus is, but they of course can still cause that reaction in which the hydrogen sulfide gas re reacts with the iron, iron sulfide, and that's corrosion in, in those environments. Um, but it is interesting to note that if this becomes excessive, if H2S production becomes excessive, um, it can really cause death zones. We actually call them death zones. So I think in Caden, my ear, do you fish? I'm, I, know, I know you hunt, but um, you might have experienced this where if you go fishing like in a high mountain lake uh, that's not in balance, there's something wrong with it, and you step into the mud and then you pull your foot back up out of the muck and you smell hydrogen sulfide gas, well, that may be normal when it's in balance, but if you've ever seen a black zone that's a, just a death zone where everything is dying, that's due to massive production um, of hydrogen sulfide. And it actually wrecks havoc with the adenine pool, right, meaning the balance between ATP, ADP, AMP, and that causes death in the long run. This is a really beautiful picture of one of my favorite Winogradsky columns. And we're seeing it happen in Simon's uh, column as well. So you can see down here that you've got a beautiful band of green sulfur bacteria. Can you see that? It's just so gorgeous. And then you've got a lovely band of purple sulfur bacteria forming there. Uh, so your bands are just in a slightly different spot, probably because your soil is not as deep as the soil is in this picture. Here you get to see more of the anaerobic zone where there's a lot more of the black, and then you see the green sulfur bacteria and the purple sulfur bacteria. Why these are the anoxygenic phototrophs that are just using that H2S to donate electrons to their photosystem. So remember the difference between oxygenic and anoxygenic phototrophs, I hope you remember, is that oxygenic phototrophs rip their electrons off of water, whereas anoxygenic phototrophs rip them off of something else, for example, H2S. So H2S instead of H2O. So let's look at these uh, green and purple sulfur bacteria. We'll begin with purple because purple is just so quite lovely. Um, that is my mother's favorite color. She wants to dye her hair purple someday. Um, <laughs> when it comes back after uh, treatment, maybe we should just we should encourage her to uh, to dye it purple. Um, be a little bit on the purple sulfur bacteria side. So purple bacteria uh, are gram negative bacteria. This is a th this is a theme, right? We see this reoccurring gram negative, gram negative. There's a lot of environmental bugs that are gram negative. Interestingly though, they don't always look purple. In our two columns here, they look pretty dang purple. Um, though there's some exceptions in this, this column, this older column, um, if you happen to know uh, Dominic or Nathan, they were in an earlier semester, but some of their bands are a little more orangey. Um, so sometimes purple sulfur bacteria can look orange, it depends on the ratio of their pigments, right? The phycobilins versus the carotenoids, because remember those are what are visible in purple bacteria. Recall that the bacterial chlorophyll is not because it's absorbing light more shifted towards the IR, the really long wavelengths of light. 
But these are in uh, the class gamma proteobacteria. So uh, quiz yourself right now to think what volume of Berge's manual would I find more information about the purple sulfur bacteria, knowing that they're gamma proteobacteria. They are, as we mentioned, photolithoautotrophic. So these photoautotrophs, of course, are getting their energy from light, and they have all of the functional components of the Kelvin cycle to build their own sugar. They're strictly anaerobic, and they live in these kind of crazy niches where we see, you know, in, in this column, this is getting light, right? So this area is definitely hit by light, but it isn't hit by any oxygen. And that's a unique niche. Think about what would hap have to happen in nature for that to occur. Think of like a stagnant water body where light was getting through the water and penetrating, but oxygen wasn't. That's the kind of niche that purple sulfur bacteria will love. They're motile, um, and they are more close in size to yeast cells than they are to back, like many of the bacterial cells that we worked with that, are, that were also gamma proteobacteria. So it's a large gamma proteobacterium. They have these internal sulfur storage granules. So uh, they have a really beautiful kind of cellular... Um, image <laughs> because I mean, they should be on the front of nature because they're so pretty with their internal sulfur storage granules. I'm going to show you some pictures of representative genera um, including chromatium and thiospirillium. Um, and so th thiospirillum and cr chromatium are going to be good examples of what's going to contribute to the banding, the purple banding in the column. I'm going to uh, go ahead and show you a picture and uh, you know if you're I mean, it could be there's someone sexy-minded enough out there that they've got their final exam open and they're answering the last question of the multiple choice section of the final exam because this is a picture of the beautiful um, purple sulfur bacterium chromatium and you can see that it has the internal sulfur storage granules. It's a shame this picture is in black and white, but here you can get a view for the stagnant water body where the purple sulfur bacteria are growing up in excess and just uh, giving a phenomenal purple color to, to that environment. This is not a picture that I took. Sadly, it's one from your textbook, so if anyone ever gets a picture like this, send it my way. Now, pulling ourselves back to one of these lovely columns, uh, you can see in this particular spot, and yes, once again, this is the forgotten column uh, of Megan, Courtney, Mariah, and Katie, um, and Simon. Uh, so down here, you can see that you've got the green sulfur and then the purple sulfur bacteria. And then finally above that, you see some striations almost that are forming there. Sometimes these look more purple than other times, and these are the purple non-sulfur bacteria. So where there's purple sulfur bacteria, there's purple non-sulfur bacteria, and I bet you can guess that these don't use hydrogen sulfide as their electron donor. You got it! So in actuality, they are going to use something uh, organic for their source of electrons, so their electron donor. Um, it are their molecules that are orga organic. Um, and so when we think about what that says about the overall name that we would give to this group, I want you to ponder that. However, they do require light, of course, to excite those electrons. So if they are living via their most preferred strategy, what that means is that they are photo heterotrophs or photo organo heterotrophs. These are the really weird ones that we have trouble wrapping our minds around. So we can also say, and I should mention those of you who have seen the very tall column that I showed off in lab. Um, at one point I was pretty mad at that column because it just wasn't developing coloring coloration that I thought was very lovely. And so I was like, I'm wrapping aluminum foil around you and putting you in the dark. <laughs> And at that moment, the purple non-sulfur bacteria just looked at me and said, they just looked at me and gave me the finger. They're like, oh, well, if you take away our light, we're just going to shift and we're going to live um, using a chemotrophy. So they just go ahead and shift over and use chemotrophic metabolism in the absence of light. They're very, very flexible, very, very versatile. Um, so they're, they didn't, they weren't bothered by that. Of course, we also know that they would lose their pigment because there would be no need for them to be making light-absorbing pigments. 
you could think about the genetics of that, right? The suppression of the genes needed to make those pigments over a long term in the dark. If uh, I think I left that column for like a whole summer in the dark. So they, at some point, downregulated the expression of those genes needed to make the pigments to absorb light. They don't have any internal sulfur storage granules, so they're not quite as pretty as the purple sulfur bacteria are. They don't have gas vesicles. Most of our purple non-sulfur bacteria are motile or flagellated. And they have a lot of variable uh, manifestations. They can be spirals, they can be rods, they can be half circles. So they have a lot of diverse morphologies. One of the most famous is Rhodopseudomonas, and one that we would see in our Winogradsky column. Lots of aquatic environments where we might see them the same places that you see the purple sulfur bacteria in these bogs and sort of stagnant water uh, bodies, such as paddy fields. These are pictures showing the diverse morphologies of these uh, different uh, purple non-sulfur bacteria. And you can see how diverse, uh, and you know, I shouldn't malign them. They really are beautiful as well, aren't they? So we've begun working our way through the column and we met our anaerobically respiring desulfovibrio, our fermentative clostridium, our wafting up hydrogen sulfide gas, fueling our purple sulfur bacteria, and then we met our very flexible purple non-sulfur bacteria. And now we need to catch on to the, the green sulfur bacteria in the band that often forms just subsurface of the purple sulfurs. Now you might guess that the green sulfur bacteria like the purple sulfur for bacteria use H2S as their electron donor. You guessed right. So that is one thing that unites them. However, it's interesting to note that although they have that striking um, metabolic similarity, they are not phylogenetically very closely related. Said another way, these are found all the way in Berge's Manual Volume 1. They're not close at all with respect to gene sequences. And yet, they live in the same environments, or at least just slightly subsurface, of the purple sulfur bacteria, where they too use hydrogen sulfide as their reducing power to uh, donate to their photosystems. They live, as well, using anoxygenic photo phototrophy. They're also diverse, uh, seeing various shapes ranging from rods cocci to vibrios. They don't they sometimes have gas vesicles, but not as commonly, and they do lack flagella. So their um, surf sulfur storage granules are not usually visible internal to the cell, so you might differentiate them from purple sulfur bacteria in that way. Sometimes they will store the sulfur outside of the cell rather than inside. But if you think about this, it makes a lot of sense that the uh, green sulfur bacteria would want to be subsurface to the purple sulfur because they don't have that ability to move in response to their environment the way that the, the purple sulfurs do. So they really want to be tucked away in that niche that gets light but it doesn't get any oxygen. So they generally live in sulfur rich habitats as we might guess and they include some things like chlorobium and pelodictian. These are pictures, pelodictian on the left, chlorobium on the right, and again diverse morphologies. So we've now covered a lot of the strata in our Winogradsky columns, um, and we will come back a little bit to them, but it's important to note that where there's green sulfur bacteria, well, what about green non-sulfur? Well, there are, but they do not live in the Winogradsky column, and that is because they're thermophilic. So the green non-sulfur bacteria, we're going to have to travel back to Yellowstone in order to meet them again. They're a big part of what comprises the bacterial mats in Yellowstone. They are like purple non-sulfur bacteria, and of course the fact that they use organic molecules as their electron donors. They prefer the, the life that is photoheterotrophic, but they too are flexible. You know, give them a hit, loss of light, and they'll continue to live chemotrophically. They often use gliding motility to move around, and you can see chloroflexus is actually the only genus that's been really um, cultured and characterized. So it shows you a little bit about the filamentous structure. This filamentous kind of mucilaginous uh, structure is really valuable in making the microbial mats of Yellowstone. Now, not Norris. 
Now we're traveling back, say we're, we're headed back home now, and we're going down past lower and upper geyser basins, and this is where we're going to see the microbial mats that chlorofluxus is a part of. Um, it really likes these neutral to alkaline hot springs, so it doesn't like the acids, but upper and lower geyser basin are more neutral. So say you're walking around the boardwalk of lower geyser basin, you're going to see some amazing colors. And this is in part um, because of chlorofluxus, but it's also in part because of the cyanobacteria. So in conjunction with the cyanobacteria, chlorofluxus makes these mats. And you can see this picture on the lower right is one that I took. Warning people, don't mark on the bacterial mats. Have you ever seen somebody leaving their, like, writing their name in these mats? Um, it's like, it makes me think of this student I had who had a water bottle that says, um, leaving your trace is overrated, and it really is. So don't, don't mark on the microbial mats. But here we are in um, upper and lower geyser basins absolutely brilliant colors and especially in the regions where we start to see the cyanobacteria and chlorofluxus forming the mats they don't tolerate temperatures much above about 70 degrees celsius that's still real hot but they they will live kind of on the peripheries of the super super hot spots so the super super hot spots will commonly be the um the areas where thermo thermos aquaticus lives right the pcr bacterium but the mats themselves are rad. And this is a picture I am so proud of because I literally happened on a buffalo right at the moment that it made a footprint in the mat. And it perfectly um, showed the vertical striations within that mat and the chromatic adaptation. So notice that here, chlorofluxus is living phototrophically. It's getting light. Down here, it's living chemotrophically, right? Because it doesn't have any light getting there. So this is so cool. The cyanobacteria, too, are dividing labor um, within this mat. So the ones that are farther away from the light, they're not doing oxygenic photosynthesis. Instead, they're um, dedicating themselves to nitrogen fixation. Remember that division of labor that we talked about within their world. So this is such a cool picture um, and, and one that, as I said, I'm very stoked to have. This one is also an upper geyser basin where you really can see the oranges um, and yellows of the microbial mat of cyanobacteria and chlorofluxus. So remember, one um, anoxygenic photoheterotroph living in community with the cyanobacteria, which are oxygenic phototrophs, right, taking their electrons off of water. So it's this nice synergy of the two types of bacteria. Here is where I stuck my head under the boardwalk, um, and Martin is laughing at me, I imagine, but this is a place where we could really see chromatic adaptation. Under the boardwalk where there's less light, you see more chlorophyll production, and outside, and outside, where, there's outside where there's less light, you see more microbial noise, 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 noise accessory, accessory payments, being made because they're, they're getting more light and more light. So this is a pretty cool shot. This is probably one of my favorites where you can really see the characteristic V pattern um, of upper, this one's actually lower geyser basin. And so you can see here the white is where it's the hottest, where something like Thermos aquaticus would be. And then radiating out, we start to get the cyanobacteria and chlorofluxus in these yellow and orange areas. So they're about 70 degrees uh, Celsius. So they like it a little cooler than Thermos aquaticus does in that sort of central region. And there's less life, right, in the hotter, hotter areas, at least that we know. So this is another beautiful V pattern picture. And this is a picture taken by one of my prior students, um, but also one of the prior um, very important um, logistical managers for the EPSCOR grant, Rick Matlock. And he did, he did a great job of getting this the oranges of some of these microbial mats. Just a beautiful photo. So of course, that leads us in a beautiful segue to talk about the cyanobacteria. Um, we know that the uh, green non-sulfur bacteria live in combination with the cyanobacteria in the mats of Yellowstone. 
But additionally, the cyanobacteria also live in our Winogradsky column. So when we come back to Mariah and Katie and Megan and Blair and Simon's uh, column, we can see up top is where we start to get the growth of oxygenic phototrophs. So up in this area, though it's a little hard to see, uh, is where you're going to get things like the cyanobacteria, uh, no stock, and others. These are, again, oxygenic phototrophs, right? They get their electrons from water, meaning that they make what? You have to think about that for a moment. So oxygenic photosynthesis. Not only do they perform oxygenic photosynthesis with photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, but they also are big time nitrogen fixers. And this is super ironic, as we talked about in lab. Um, and that is because the enzyme that fixes nitrogen, that converts nitrogen gas into ammonia, that enzyme nitrogenase is inactivated by oxygen. And hopefully you just thought to yourself, oh yeah, oxygenic phototrophs, the thing that makes them named that is that they produce oxygen. And yet the irony, right, is that the nitrogenase enzyme is inactivated by that oxygen. So how in the world do the cyanobacteria both fix nitrogen and do oxygenic photosynthesis at the same time? Well, they don't. Or they have some sort of protective strategy for their nitrogenase enzyme. Remember learning in rhizobium about leg hemoglobin and its role. But we also can recognize that they might have a way of separating the two processes. So, for example, Cinecoccus, it only does it in the dark. You know people like that, right? Um, but it only fixes nitrogen when they're not doing oxygenic photosynthesis. No light, no oxygenic photosynthesis, no uh, risk of inactivating the nitrogenase enzyme. So this is their way of protecting the nitrogenase enzyme. We know that no stock forms heterocysts. So remember the, uh, the, the pickup line that you all are saving, or maybe some of you have used it, for uh, someone you know you want to be in your life for a very long time. Um, if I were a cyanobacterium, I'd want to be a heterocyst in your trichome. Uh, literally meaning I would give up my ability to generate energy knowing that I would get energy from you, the surrounding cells within the um, community, and that I would dedicate myself to one unique process that would feed and fuel the entire colony. Come to think of it, this is actually a more appropriate agape kind of pickup line. Uh, that is uh, meaning group love, right? So maybe this is like, you know, when you're on that team, that ski team that you really love. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, di you're, uh, in, you're dividing labor amongst one another, and that's what a heterosis does. And of course, we also saw in the picture previously the way in which um, the cells lower in the microbial mat weren't fixing, or were fixing nitrogen, and the ones higher in the microbial mat were uh, doing oxygenic photosynthesis, and then again you're getting that division of labor. So there's a lot, there are a lot of cyanobacteria, many of which uh, form that multicellular association. And come to think of that, I can't remember whose group it was, Jessica maybe, that saw this on your Winogradsky column. So it was pretty neat to see what we thought might have been cyanobacteria um, forming a trichome where there were a lot of cells packed into a straw-like structure, um, one right after another, kind of in a line. They often have gas vesicles. They're uh, able to move in response to light. That makes sense with regards to their lifestyle, photo autotrophy. And they use a variety of mechanisms to reproduce. These include binary fission, budding, fragmentation, and one that we haven't met yet, multiple fission. This quite literally means that the mother cell gets longer and longer and longer and longer and longer, and then it finally, um, and you know, the, there's a replication of the nucleic acids again and again and again, and finally the whole dang thing becomes many daughter cells all at once. Like, talk about efficiency of reproduction. Um, these guys produce a lot of babies at one time. Um, so multiple fission is a lifestyle that some cyanobacteria will use. They're also pretty lucky, just in the same way that when the going get tough, the tough form endospores. Well, when the going gets tough, tough cyanobacteria form aconetes. Aconetes are these dormant resistant structures that allow them to live in desiccation. 
Here are some beautiful pictures, my favorite, no stock, right? Heterocyst in the trichome. Very, very, very beautiful. And some others that also, Anabina is one of my favorites as well. I know there are a couple of you that live in the Colorado area, and I don't remember if anybody lives near um, Estes Park or in between Fort Collins and Estes Park. This is actually a bike ride that I like to do. It takes about four hours going from Fort Collins to Denver, to the outskirts of Denver, but you kind of go towards the road that goes to Estes Park, and it's really pretty. But this is a really good example of what happens when cyanobacteria grow unchecked and out of control. That is when we see excessive NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, um, being leached into the water from um, pollutants like detergents and fertilizers. And this is a nuisance bloom. So these nuisance bloom form, these are a type of HAB or harmful algal bloom. These HABs are really bad because in excess cyanobacteria, historically and inaccurately called blue-green algae, um, will release compounds that, at, if they're in excess, right, if it's a bloom like this, the compounds that they release can become carcinogenic in those amounts. It's really gross when a nuisance bloom dies. So here it's kind of like you could see it's, it's green, it's alive, but when it dies, it becomes this um, just incredible scum that's very smelly. So the last thing that I want to talk about relates to what you might have been pondering for quite a while now, and that is you're thinking, why is Rachel wearing that button? What is that button anyway? I can't see it very well. This is my don't bust the crust button. Um, <laughs> and I have no doubt that Martha has spent some time hiking around in uh, the Colorado Plateau or Southeast Utah, where there are beautiful microbiotic or cryptobiotic crusts. Now, you might be look at, looking at this and think, man, Rachel, that doesn't look that beautiful to me. But this is one of the most beautiful things on Earth. This little knob right here is made up of cyanobacteria and other organisms that come together in a mucolaginous sort of conglomeration. The cyanobacteria ooze out this mucolaginous substance that chelates up or binds up the sand particles in a desertous environment. And over hundreds of years, this particular knob formed probably is about a hundred years old. And it grows slowly, 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 slowly until finally it's capable of absorbing moisture and preventing erosion and fixing nitrogen. And therefore, it creates um, this beautiful environment where flowers and other things can grow up because the soil is now rich in nitrogen and fixed nitrogen, right? So you get the um, lovely secondary growth of desert flowers. And there's nothing more beautiful than a desert flower. So don't bust the crust. <laughs> and if you've ever been to um, Arches National Park, you may have picked up one that looks like this where it's all about don't bust the crust and talks about the role that these crusts play in um, remediating soil in order to allow growth, um, enriching soil with nitrogen and stopping erosion. Um, this is another pamphlet similar to that. It shows the way in which cyanobacteria grow in these uh, fibrous structures and bind up the soil particles, the, the sandy soil particles. So every year I take the ski team backpacking and we um, have our day before lesson about the crust and we all tiptoe with our backpacks throughout the desert. Um, so, and in fact, if you put something about that on the extra credit, uh, I would love to give you a point of extra credit about why we tip throw, tiptoe through the desert. So we uh, end our coverage by making sure that everyone knows what the striations in the Winogradsky column were because they end with cyanobacteria. They began with the um, disulfovibrio and clostridium in the anaerobic sediment. 
at the interface of the anaerobic sediment and the anaerobic water, we had our beautiful anoxygenic phototrophs, such as thiospirillum and chromatium, and those that were um, purple sulfur bacteria, and then, uh, of course, green sulfur bacteria just subsurface to those. And then our rhodopseudomonas and others that are the purple non-sulfur bacteria. And then, of course, on the very top are the cyanobacteria. So with that, I will leave you, and I hope that I can leave you by simply saying, may you always pursue a sexy mind. May you always ask why, no matter how seemingly intelligent the person you're listening to is. <laughs>